Hello. All right, I think we are getting started here. Welcome. Um, great. Yes, welcome. Um, we are going to be getting started in just a couple minutes here at two o'clock. Uh, if you're joining us live, uh, just hang out for a couple minutes. Um, if you are watching this after the fact, just feel free to, to jump the video a couple minutes ahead um, to get to the, the program. Uh, but for those of, that, of you that are joining us now, welcome. Um, just going to make sure that the volume and everything is looking good. So, good. Um, and before we get into this, I guess uh, let me just take a moment to say thanks to our sponsor. Uh, Yankee Bookstore has sponsored our, our Europe programs. Um, we're very generous of them to do that. So thanks to them. Um, and all of our members uh, of the Historical Society that make it possible for us to, to do this. So thanks. If you're not already a member and you're watching and enjoying this, you know, it's a great way to support local history and, um, uh, you know, be able to support these programs. And it's pretty pretty nice. Um, just go to our website, marathoncountyhistory.org, or, you know, come on in and give us a call or uh, visit us in person and we can tell you more. All right. Well, a couple of people joining us. Welcome. Um, I got through my early announcements. We don't, we don't. This is the last history speaks of this year. So normally this is where I would tell you what's coming next. But um, we're we're still working on the schedule for next year. Um, I can tell you about chats. Uh, this so today we're talking about a um, uh, Scott Alwyn, who's a um, uh, a veteran uh, during the Vietnam era. Um, we are spending this month in our history chats. These are our weekly sessions where every Thursday we, we go for about 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, and coming up next, uh, this Thursday, which is, is happens to be a Veterans Day, um, we're going to be talking about Bill Hayes, uh, who was um, a paratrooper in the 101st Airborne, um, was actually in this, you can see him highlighted here, uh, he was the um, uh, part part of this this famous picture with Dwight Eisenhower uh, on the day before D Day, or, or the day before D Day. So um, a very interesting story. Uh, started as a wallpaper uh, salesman at Sears, and you know when the war started, went on and and uh, served his country in a really interesting way. So I'll tell you about his life um, coming up this Thursday. Um, but that's this Thursday. Um, right now we're we're going to be talking um, about uh, again. Scott Allen's story, and I'm just going to, I think we're ready to start, so without further ado, um, oh, turn my webcam off, you don't need to see me for this, there we go, I'm going to introduce uh, Pamela, uh, who is the, the sister of, of Scott, and is going to be um, recounting his, his, his life story a little bit here. Good Thank afternoon, you. it's so pleasant, it's such a pleasure to be here, especially coming up on Veterans Day, which of course started out as Armistice Day. And I think when Eisenhower probably turned it into Veterans Day sometime, I think in 1954, it was probably because he himself had been so impressed with uh, the courage and service of the veterans during World War II. But the hero we're going to talk to you about today is Scott Alwyn, Captain Scott Alwyn. And I am the co-producer of the upcoming documentary, Honor in the Air, which will be a story about his life and service, as well as the story of so many of the others who served with him in Vietnam in the 68th Assault Helicopter Company and elsewhere. Scott was born and raised in Wisconsin. He was born in Milwaukee, and uh, he was one of 16 siblings. Now, I'm sure that my middle class, upper middle class mother, thought that when my father said, hey, I want a large family, uh, she thought maybe he meant three or four kids rather than the acceptable one or two. But what he really meant was, oh, 10 or 12 plus three or four adopted ones just for good measure. My father was a Harvard-educated um, fifth-generation German Lutheran theologian uh, who left Harvard Divinity to become a pilot in World War II. And uh, of the 33 guys that he went in with, only two of them came out alive. And he ended up, I think, because they thought he already had such a large family as an instructor. And my poet mother uh, ended up teaching the hydraulics of a B-29 to, 
to guys who were very often more interested in her girlish figure than they were in the hydraulics that she was trying to in, uh, instill in their brains. But uh, as I say, Scott was born and raised in Wisconsin. My, my dad thought Milwaukee was no place to raise a big family, so he took three little country churches and took us out to the country to live in various and sundry parsonages in rural, mostly central Wisconsin. And usually when I say parsonage, I mean some old abandoned farmhouse that they could palm off on the big minister's family and because nobody else wanted to live there, of course. As I recall, the last uh, home that we lived in had two electric light bulbs and one electric socket. And that was only because my dad and my older brothers actually cut a path through the woods so that they would bring in one line of electricity. But Scott was raised um, in a family which ed in which education was highly valued in reading and literature and poetry and of course uh, religion. And so he grew up on uh, sayings like, uh, oh, one for all, all for one, uh, key out it, uh, you know, honor before all or um, you know, come home with your shield or on it, or the old French one, a cour valiant, no rien impossible, you know, and uh, a, a nightly prayer always was, uh, help me grow up to be a big, strong, honest man or woman, as the case may be, who loves and cares about other people. Unfortunately, I think he took it to heart because uh, it seems that that went with him his whole life and honor was extremely important to him. Plus, I'm not sure he ever sloughed off being a preacher's kid. Uh, a preacher's kid is a special breed of kid, and um, you, you really have to try hard to become something other than someone to whom religion and uh, uh, conscience are part of your everyday, um, part of your everyday existence. But Scott was by nature an adventurous kid, and he was always a very independent kid. One of my earliest recollections of him as a child is of him running down the street after my father's departing uh, vehicle, screaming at the top of his lungs, Daddy, you take your Scotty man with you. You take your... And when, of course, he couldn't catch the car, well, then he would resort to climbing the great big oak tree across the, the road and sitting up there at 20 feet in the, in the air with my mother imploring him to come down saying, no, I, I'm watching for daddy to come home, you know. And so this was a kid who um, was invested in his own independence and f at a very early age. And when we were kids, uh, dad would take us to the runways at Billy Mitchell Field and we would just sit there with a box of saltines and uh, you know, a pound and a half of liver sausage sliced nicely by the butcher and a couple of glass bottles full of chocolate milk, and we would watch the airplanes take off and land. I mean, that was a that was our big entertainment, and we'd discuss um, the various types of aircraft and the engines and the sound and whether or not the ailerons were in the correct position for a landing or a takeoff. As my father would critique every landing or takeoff, and I think that's probably where Scott developed his love of aviation. I, I don't think that he ever got over those early excursions to Billy Mitchell. But when we were growing up in central Wisconsin on those various parsonages, uh, it was kind of a tough existence. I mean, we were, in fact, a, a big and quite poor family because, quite frankly, uh, rural ministry doesn't pay all that much. And so from a very early age, we knew that we had to get out and work. And whatever we did for work, it went back to the family coffers. We thought nothing about working in the fields and the truck farms next to the migrants. And as I recall, it was 10 cents for, you got paid for a quart of strawberries and two cents a pound for pickling cucumbers. But you learned the tricks pretty quickly. I mean, a few stones in the burlap bag and you're pickling cucumbers, we had a lot more. So, and all the money went home to the family. But it was also a time of uh, shared experience that created a tremendous unity and a tremendous love for one another and wove us very, very tightly into the fabric of that big family. 
when um, my dad decided that he was going to have a second chance with Scott as another generation of theologian and put Scott into Concordian Seminary in Milwaukee, um, that didn't work very well. I mean, I don't think it was something for which Scott was temperamentally um, predisposed. And so um, it only lasted for about a year and a half, and then Scott came back to Fort Atkinson, which was where we were living by that time, and went to Fort Atkinson High School. And in Fort, he really um, was quite a good student, actually. I mean, he loved history. He found a professor um, or a teacher at, at Fort High School who was a mentor and a true scholar and really enabled him to examine a lot of historical issues and, and milieus that he might never have had exposure to. But he became the editor of the local high school paper and he uh, was in plays and he was in sports and things like that. And so his, uh, his performance actually allowed him to garner a, an appointment to the Air Force Academy through Senator Nelson at the time. And uh, there is a photograph of him uh, that somebody did of his official appointment to the Air Force Academy. Is that the, the painting one? Yeah, that's yeah. the painting one. And... But unfortunately, that didn't last very long either, because as I said, Scott had um, already indicated to all and sundry that he was kind of a independent person. And as far as he was concerned, the discipline that was being imposed on them as cadets was not something that was going to turn them into great officers and great military thinkers. It was just being done for the sake of discipline. I remember getting a letter from him that said, they gave me demerits for coming out of the shower with one drop of water on my back. He said, this place sucks, which was succinct and to the point. And as soon as he was done with the amount of time that would have, con that would have uh, constituted his active service, he resigned and came back to Wisconsin and started at the university. And while at the university, he continued his flying though and got a, um, a fixed wing license there along with ultimately, in the end, a degree in political science. But... Um, was that just for his own enjoyment of flying? Yeah, was that was... A, no, that was just for his own enjoyment of flying. But uh, in the meantime, Vietnam was heating up. Mm -hmm. And so he went and uh, volunteered for the Army and because they told him they would make sure that he could fly. And what they were going to make sure that he could fly was helicopters which he thought was a pretty exciting uh, new wave in, in military um, strategy to use the use of these helicopters. And so he went down to um, Texas to do the book learning part of, of being in a helicopter. And then he finally got into a helicopter and he wrote me and he said, this is, this is utter insanity. He said, this thing has four controls. Each, each limb is associated with a control, which is then doing two or three different things. He said, nobody but a crazy person would want to do this. I love it. <laughs> so, and uh, while he was there, he, his roommate was a guy by the name of Tom, and I wish I knew the guy's last name. But Tom um, was apparently an extraordinary pilot, and um, Scott was just in awe of him. And the two of them graduated at the top of their class, and then they both went together to Fort Rucker in Alabama, which is where you would actually do your flying time and, and get into a helicopter. And the second day that they were there, I believe, uh, they had finally gone up in solo with an instructor, and they were all off in various uh, directions from the, the, from the field and suddenly they received an order to return to the field. And as they came back, uh, Scott said that he saw a huge column of black smoke rising. And sure enough, this guy who he just loved um, was dead. His, uh, his instructor had, they think, had a heart attack. And so the helicopter nosedived from about 700 feet. 
And you would think that that might have put a crimp in his uh, enthusiasm for flying a helicopter, but it never did. I mean, he truly believed that those machines were going to revolutionize warfare, and in point of fact, they probably did, at least as far as Vietnam and um, conflict since then has, has happened. The thing about helicopters is that they're so iconic, that sound that they make. I, I did a presentation at the American Legion convention, and we had a looping soundtrack of the helicopter, sort of like that one you hear at the beginning of Apocalypse Now, you mm -hmm. know, that and that whoop, whoop, whoop when they're coming in. And in between sessions, the old veterans would be walking down the hallways and they'd hear that sound and they would stop in their tracks and they would come over and trying to investigate where that sound was because there wasn't a, a, a veteran from Vietnam and many from Af Afghanistan and Iraq who weren't either put in, inserted by helicopter, covered by helicopter, or rescued by helicopter. And so that sound is so meaningful to them. And they'd come over and they'd see the nose cone art and they would kind of just stroke it. Mm. You know, I mean, it meant so much to them and you'd see the tears in their eyes. But as I say, I mean, Scott thought that um, helicopters in Vietnam were going to be something that would revolutionize uh, warfare there. But when he got to Vietnam, here's where that being a preacher's kid comes into play again. Um, you always started out in the slicks, which were really basically the transports. They were the same thing as the gunships, except they didn't have all the armor and they didn't have all the weaponry. All they had was um, a, a gunner standing on each side or a gunner and a crew chief. Mostly what they were doing was transporting the troops in and out of an LZ, a landing zone, yeah. or um, in some cases doing the duty that all of them hated most, which was transporting uh, celebrities around, you know, mm -hmm. dignitaries, which all of them thought was just BS. Anyway, but, um, but to Scott's way of thinking, the slicks were doing probably the job that was as or more important than any other. And he, even though he kept being invited to get to the gunships, because you had to be invited to become a gunship pilot, mm -hmm. he would always tell those guys, and one guy in particular, a guy, a um, roommate of his by the name of Ed Struzzini, no, I'm not coming to the gunships. You guys, you guys just want to count coup, and uh, that's not what we're here for, and I think what I'm doing is important. The only reason he eventually went to the gunships was because um, a young guy came into the unit and um, got invited to go to the gunships from the slicks, and Scott told him, don't go. It's too soon. You just don't have enough experience. But the guy accepted the invitation and went to the gunships, and within two weeks he was dead. Um, it was a, a risky, risky business. In fact, I think the casualty figures for helicopter pilots in Vietnam was something like 50%. Uh, it doesn't mean fatalities, but it means casualties. They were mm -hmm. out, of, out of commission or dead. And uh, I remember seeing a statistic somewhere that said in combat, the life expectancy for a helicopter was about 30 seconds. So, uh, which seems really extreme, but of the 5,000 helicopters, of the 5,000 pilots that were over there, 2,500 were dead. So, in any event, he finally, after that, after the death of that young guy, he finally went into the gunships because he figured, if I'm, if I'm there, somebody else won't be. And he knew he was a really good pilot. He, and the, the, to say that he was a good pilot almost doesn't mean anything to those of us who have never done it. But the guys who talk about it, they talk about it with a certain degree of, not awe, but, but true admiration. They would say, yeah, yeah, Alwyn, he was a silver dollar driver. You know, he could, when he had control of that cyclic, that stick, he would never have to move it more than the width of a silver dollar to get that ship to do what he wanted. 
And I mean, and you know, the funny thing is I have horses and some of my horses do dressage. And dressage is the old military uh, training for horses to teach them as you use your you use your seat bones and your and your legs and because your hand one held a sword and one held a revolver if you were lucky and if you were on their bit it couldn't be more than just your baby fingers doing it because you were too busy doing other things and so to be able to to control that helicopter with just that little bit of pressure and that movement, or they'd say, yeah, that old one, you could set it down, you'd never even know it was on the ground, it was so smooth. But they really, um, they, all of them thought very highly of his ability as a helicopter pilot. And he developed something called an auto-rotational maneuver. In, in the early days, if something happened to your tail rotor, Basically, you began to spin and you lost lift and you just dropped out of the sky like a stone. And so he figured that there had to be a way to overcome this. And I'm sure I can't explain it to you, but I have a feeling that, I mean, you got these 48 foot long rotors whopping through the air and somehow or other he decided that this auto rotational, you could, you could get them, you could get the body of the aircraft going in one direction and, and it would create enough lift against the movement of the rotors that you could keep it in the air long enough to actually set it down without just plummeting out of the sky. And so he went to the safety officer of the unit, a guy by the name of King, and together they uh, developed this as a maneuver that was then taught to everybody, all the pilots in the, in the unit and it became standard training for all the other pilots everywhere, and it's still taught today. I mean, there was a, there was even a movie with Gene Hackman, uh, who is an old Vietnam helicopter pilot who is being called to action again, and he comes in and he says, somebody tell me about that auto-rotational movement. So, I mean, it's something that, that helicopter pilots are still taught today, and it's still saving lives. And at the same time, we heard a rumor, we, we haven't been able to pin this one down, but that there was a slick driver uh, in 68, and Scott served from 67 to 72 in Vietnam, uh, that there was a slick driver, which is what Scott was doing at that time, uh, and they had been called out to rescue a company that had been really badly ravaged by the Viet Cong and was, and was still uh, in tremendous danger by a place called An Ki. And uh, when these guys call in, they would tell them, listen, you gotta clear a hole for us in the jungle. We gotta have a 60 foot hole in the jungle. And uh, you know, the guys are under such pressure that they got there and it was a 30 foot hole. So, um, and so the uh, commander of the, of the group said, well, that's it. We're we're out of here. But one of the drivers, one of the sick drivers said, nah, wait, wait a second. And with his rotors going one direction and his helicopter going the other, he took it right straight down through the jungle and used it like a weed whacker. Mm. Now we can't prove that that was Scott, but it certainly sounds like the other movement that he had just been working on. So it, it may well have been, we just don't know. But um, we personally, didn't think of Scott as a hero. You know, it never occurred to us uh, that what he was doing over there was heroic. And um, it wasn't until he was dead and we had people showing up at the house, just mm -hmm. out of the clear blue sky, to talk to mom and dad and say, hey, listen, uh, you know, my name is William or my name is Franz or my name is so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, I served with Scott and I just wanted to come and talk to you and see where he was buried. And um, they would come and they'd sit on the floor and or at the kitchen table drinking tea and they'd tell us stories about the things that he had done. And we knew that uh, one of them said he'd been nominated twice for the Congressional Medal of Honor and both times it was for volunteer missions 
And at one of those occasions, a guy was sitting next to me on the floor, and he said he'd been the, uh, the crew chief on a lot of Scott's missions. And he's sitting on this pale gray carpet with his legs folded and his hands resting on his knees, and he starts to tell this story. And he says, yeah, he said, well, he said, so um, they called us all in and they said, well, we got a, we got a volunteer mission. We got to go rescue some orphans from this uh, orphanage that's about to be overrun by the Viet Cong. And uh, he said, I kind of looked around the room. He said, just in, in true Army tradition, nobody's volunteering. He said, and then I looked all of a sudden, there goes this hand up in the air. And he said, he said, damn it, I just knew it was Alwyn. I just knew it was Alwyn. And he said, sure enough, there he was. And he says, I'll do it. And uh, by this time, the guy is sitting there on the carpet next to me, and his hand's beginning to tremble a little bit. And he said, worse yet, he said, um, Alwyn says, I only want to take one guy with me. And he said, I don't know why. He said, but all of a sudden, there's my hand going up, and he's saying, okay, I'll, I'll go. And um, so he said, we, we, we got the, in the helicopter, and we headed out, and he said, we got there, and he said, I swear to God, there was only three or four inches of clearance for those rotors because it was a great big stone courtyard. Mm -hmm. And he said, probably there was five or six feet of clearance. He said, but nobody's crazy enough to sit down with only five or six feet of clearance for your rotors. He said, except Alwyn, he did it. And so we're picking up those kids, and he said, and there stands the priest with the two nuns and the older kids, all of whom had to know that they were going to be dead in a little while. He said, so here I am in the back stacking these little kids in. He said, and I turned around and looked out that windshield as we were about ready to lift off. He said, and here is that priest standing there making the sign of the cross, over this war machine being driven by a preacher's kid in the middle of the jungle of Vietnam. He said it was such a surreal moment. He said, I've never, ever forgotten it. And, uh, of course, my problem is that this happened right after Scott was killed. And we don't know who these guys were. These were guys who would just show up and say, hey, uh, can you tell me where Scott's buried? Or, uh, so we don't have the names uh, of these people, and I wish, we, I wish we did, because it would be so meaningful today. Do, do you want to just briefly touch, um, you've been saying we a lot. Um, I, I don't know that we necessarily got in, you mentioned at the beginning, maybe. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you're collecting these stories and, and, and who we is in this? We is the people who are involved in the making of the documentary, Honor in the Air. So it is uh, myself and it is Susan Reitz, who is the producer and who is the owner of Clear Focus Media, a prize-winning uh, documentarian right here in central Wisconsin. Uh, and, of course, my brothers and sisters who are all involved in this project, too. Uh, when we go out and do this presentation to veterans groups around the state, it's normally with my dear sister, Penny, who is uh, a, a very polished and elegant public speaker. And so she does this very well with me. And we kind of, there's a lot of give and take and a lot of interaction with the audience too, which who are all veterans and have been through this thing. And um, when we went recently to the reunion of the 68th, we were doing interviews with the guys who had flown with Scott and we're just absolutely delighted and grateful that they w were uh, gallant enough to uh, sit with us. I mean, I think it was an extremely traumatic experience for some of them. One or two were simply unable to actually give filmed interviews. One gentleman kind of confided to me that he doesn't even speak to himself about this yet. I mean, you can understand the, the depth of feeling that that's evokes in those people because they really are reliving it in many ways um, but we're very grateful to the ones who did and we hope to have this documentary uh, completed for the anniversary of the withdrawal
from Vietnam in, in, in 23. So uh, it's something that we're working very hard on. But every time we get to speak with these guys, we learn more and we learn more about them and we learn more about Scott. And we don't want this documentary to simply be about Scott. We want him to serve as an exemplar, as a, um, a kind of a, a prototype for all the guys who were there. I don't care why they were there. I don't care whether they got drafted or whether they volunteered. Once they were there, the vast majority of them served with great honor and with great valor and with great distinction. But boy, I'll tell you, the one thing that it did was it created a brotherhood that is as strong as anything that I have experienced growing up in a big family. I mean, uh, they are his brothers in every way that I am his sisters, <laughs> that all the rest of us in that, in that big group are brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. But um, it is extraordinary to think that um, he is buried in a tiny little rural cemetery in central Wisconsin next to a small red brick country church and that very, very few people even know that this hero is in their midst. As far as our research can tell, he is the most decorated pilot in military history in the sense of um, having more air medals than any other pilot that has ever been um, been in, in military service in any branch, whether Air Force, Marines, Navy. Um, we are, an Air Medal signifies hours of combat missions. In Vietnam, at that point in time, you got one Air Medal for every 25 actual hours of combat time. And so his his army records that we have copies of, uh, the actual orders showing the award of the 136th Air Medal. His company records, his battalion records, show over 200 and earned. So either one is a record. I believe the next closest is a major who served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam who has, uh, I believe, 127. So Scott's all coming from Vietnam is really extraordinary if you do the math. I mean, we're talking thousands of hours of, of actual combat flight time. I can see how that'd be difficult to try to track down where he was at any point, because like right. you were saying, it could have been him, but it's well, so the, much time. And the truth of the matter is, we the Army records are so flawed uh, the the final army records that show we have show 51 air medals. Well, we've got the order yeah. showing 136, and the and the company records say over 200. Um, he it shows one distinguished flying cross when we've got the actual orders showing two. You know, it shows um, four bronze stars when we've got actual orders showing nine. You know, so I mean, so bronze stars, silver stars. Uh, two Distinguished Flying Crosses, 136 Air Medals, uh, I mean, and all of them, you know, with, with oak leaf clusters, and they truly do distinguish someone who took great pride in his ability, but I don't think he took much satisfaction from being involved in the actual war. One of the things that uh, I've, I've spoken before about the, the characteristics that emerge from having been a preacher's kid, mm -hmm. he came home on leave and one of the things he did on his 30-day leave was he and my father set out and they went around the country and visited the parents of every single person uh, from his unit who had been killed. And it literally took up his entire 30-day leave, but it was something that he just had to do. I mean, he had to go and talk to those parents. On another occasion, he went down to Chicago to a company because what he was trying to get them to develop or provide to him was a uh, basically a bullhorn. He wanted to be able to 
have a way of communicating with the people on the ground that would uh, be loud enough to be heard over the noise of the helicopter. And he did it because if you encountered Viet Cong on the ground, or you encountered Vietnamese on the ground, it was really very hard to tell the difference between the two groups. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted to be able to tell them, stand still and don't move. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we need to investigate who you are, something, anything, so that your only other alternative wasn't to have to shoot them. And, I mean, some of the stories that we have heard about um, things that he did in Vietnam um, made us understand that he carried that kind of burden, maybe, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. of a preacher's kid's conscience with him throughout that whole conflict. So, um, when I talk about Scott... I, I don't want anybody to get the impression that he was a paragon of virtue because in point of fact, as I've, as I've pointed out before, not only did he have an independent streak, but geez, he had a heck of a temper when he was a kid. Mm. I mean, he'd go for months, you know, just this kind of placid, you know, very reasonable, and then some little thing. Oh, I don't know, Lancer Brent using a BB gun to put a bullet through one of Mom's plate glass windows in the conservatory, and then he'd be on a rampage. Or, I don't know, my sister Gabrielle borrowing his car again <laughs> without asking. And uh, somehow... I was mostly the accomplice in all of these things. Mm. And to be honest, I was Scott's accomplice in about everything. Uh, he, he developed adventures. I mean, you've got, to, you've got to envision this. This is 12 or 13, maybe 14 kids in the middle of nowhere in rural Wisconsin. And my father thought that electronics like television were the work of the devil because an idle mind is the devil's work shop, and that's good German Lutheran ethics there. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we had to come up with our own, our own adventures and our own uh, entertainment. And so, if you have never ridden a pig, uh, which is very hard to do because pigs are very cunning and kind of nasty, um, there's the sport of cow jumping, which is okay, except that a lot of bovines are kind of bovine and not very exciting. But then if you add jumping them with horses, it gets a lot more exciting, you know. Yeah. So, uh, or, you know, sledding down cliff faces. You call them hills, but they're really cliff faces on cardboard boxes. And then Scott would say, well, why don't we try it standing up? <laughs> you know, I mean, things yeah. like that. I mean, so... It was always an adventure, and usually it was Scott instigating the adventure somehow. And more than once, he almost got me killed, which kind of gave me an affinity for those guys in, in the 68th who would be telling me about, yeah, and then, and then he plowed it right into the ground, you know, and I got thrown out 20 feet, and you know. But... Um, Talking to those guys in the 68th was really uh, a revelation, to be honest with you, because um, they did not only become brothers, but they, they really um, honored one another for the things that they did were, that were extraordinary and to them were commonplace. I mean, it was, uh, it was fun to listen to the guys talk about, uh, you know, uh, getting target fixated or, um, you know, limping a helicopter back or uh, surviving the crashes or, you know, that kind of thing. But um, one of the things that I shared with them was that when he was at Concordia Seminary, Scott literally, uh, literally could recite the Bible backwards and forwards. I mean, he was his father's son in that sense. And he read uh, Caesar's commentaries in Latin. 
you know, mm-hmm. so why not? Yeah. Uh, although I did point out to the guys that his favorite um, military strategist was always Hannibal. You know, get those elephants over the Alps. Why not? Think outside the box, you know. But um, so, it, you know, his favorite mili- his favorite uh, bi- biblical verse was always Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, which is, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? Then spake I and said, Here am I, Lord send me. And I always wondered whether it was just fate or some really, really strange irony as God ended up in the 68th, you know, the 68. But uh, the guys thought that was kind of, they said that that was just fate. That was, that was where he belonged. He needed to be in the 68th. Yeah. So, but um, now, I mean, I do have um, a story about Scott's childhood that I could share with the audience if you'd like to hear that. Yeah, sure. Okay. I told you that Scott was a great adventurer, and, and this is another one. And I think this probably was when he was maybe, oh, I would say 12 or so. This is called The Source of the Nile. I knew it was a mistake the minute the words left my mouth. I saw my brother Scott's eyes light up. When would I ever learn to eliminate the word adventure from my vocabulary? It was like catnip to a cat, cocaine to an addict, a guaranteed stimulus for the adolescent Scott's insatiable, inquisitive drive to explore and experience. Of course, all I had intended was a pleasant conversation about the current book I was reading, a biography of Stanley Livingston. And all I really did was happened to mention what a great adventure it must have been for him to set off like that to seek the source of the Nile. The problem wasn't just that the comment set Scott off on some wild goose chase. Oh, no. It was that, invariably, I got dragged along. He was way too darn persuasive. Oh, come on, this will be super. It'll be a great adventure. Where had I heard that one before? I'll tell you where the time when we were going to braid the horse's manes into loops so we could slip our right elbows through the hook and hook the same side leg over the horse's back, then hang off their sides at a gallop, naturally, while shooting our homemade bows and arrows under their necks at a target, just like the Apaches did. I've never seen so many hooves come so close to killing me in my whole life. Or that time we were going to climb to the very tippy top of those enormous white pine trees, regardless of the 25 mile an hour wind preceding the approaching summer thunderstorm, because if we get up to that high vantage point, the other kids, miscellaneous siblings, will never look up and see us. We can really pick them off easily one by one with our homemade bows and arrows. It seems trees bend a lot even under the slight weight of a 10 year old girl, especially if they're being whipped around by a stiff breeze. Crashing down through thick, brittle pine branches is no fun. I can tell you that from personal experience. It seems, of course, there was also the let's slide down the hill in a cardboard box, standing up. Or let's build a snow fort and camp out overnight in 10 degree weather. Or, hey, let's set up a rope course in the hayloft and swing from beam to beam 25 feet off the ground. The list could go on and on and on. So, how about we build a raft and seek the source of our very own Nile, the Rock River? Should have come as no surprise. The enterprise entered the planning and preparation phase. Scott always did like that phrase, prior planning makes perfect, even when his wasn't. We built a raft based loosely on the model shown in the old pen and ink drawings in an early edition of Huckleberry Finn we had lying around. We were all really big on the classics. We had a bunch of old logs we scavenged from out behind an abandoned warehouse next to the river and one 55-gallon drum, which we lashed together with thin cotton clothesline borrowed from home. Sorry, Mom. It was meant to be pulled, well, because that's what you did with a raft on a river, especially when you had to go up river against the current. We read that in the same book mentioned above. We gathered our provisions, government surplus peanut butter sandwiches, apples, and a used washed-out milk gallon full of lemon-lime Kool-Aid, so we were all set. The expedition was launched, sort of. 
The darn raft just wouldn't want to ride level in the water. Well, actually, one end sank right to the bottom. That one log might have just been a tad rotten. Not to worry, we simply jettisoned the log. Didn't really need that one anyway, this according to Commander Scott. I thought it seemed more like an issue with that 155-gallon drum producing an unbalanced fulcrum point. But what did I know, not having studied physics yet? The current in the shallow brown water was surprisingly strong. Apparently, the calm, seeming surface was meant to be misleading. I lost my first pole within 300 yards because Scott bumped into me as he was walking backwards, pushing his pole. I almost went into the drink, so I didn't count the loss of the pole as a really big deal. Scott apparently felt otherwise. Even though I pointed out I had possessed the incredible foresight to bring not one but two spare poles, he counseled me vigorously. For over five long hours, things went pretty darn well, and we made good, although tiring, progress. Only one more pole had been sacrificed to our forward momentum. This one we lost to a log snag. Then we came to a fork in the river. What do you think, Scott asked. You're asking me? What the heck? I have no idea where we are. I have almost no idea when we are. That's how lost I am, I thought. But what I replied a bit snappishly is, it's completely up to you. You're the leader of this expedition, aren't you? Scott decided. Okay, then. Most people given a choice like this would choose right because it's their dominant side. So I say, let's go left. Sure, of course. Be contrary. Choose what no one else ever would. I think I must have been mumbling under my breath because Scott looked up at me and asked if I had said something. And I said no in that fake cheery voice I could already do pretty darn well. It worked best with a big smile. I gave one of those too. So we went dutifully up the left fork, me thinking all the while left equates to sinister, as in evil, after the Latin sinister, or the old French sinestri, of or pertaining to the left hand. Yeah, I really did know etymologies like that already. Dad, a fifth generation German theologian, was a veritable fountain of word derivations. Ever stop to think about where the word communicate comes from? Okay, not right now. So onward we pulled for another half hour, sore shoulders, sweaty brows, cramping calves, blistered palms, and so on. The river got wider, but also shallower, much shallower. We rounded another interminable bend and it disappeared, just as the raft decided to disassemble itself. The 55-gallon drum sank slowly into the muddy water, the Kool-Aid container bobbed merrily downstream, and the logs began to drift out of their knots and rope bonds. Grab one and hang on. Now that was a command voice. I did as ordered, but the water logged. Wood did not want to bear my weight, or Scott's either for that matter. So side by side, we dog paddled to the nearest clumps of land. Ahead spread a vast expanse of reeds, cattails, and sawgrass hummocks sticking out of the fetid, stagnant brown water. In between them, if you tried to stand in the shallow water, the mud would begin to immediately suck you down. Scott had somehow managed to retain his pole. He clambered to the top of a hammock and using the pole helped me balance and helped me the top of the next one. Before us spread a grim sight. Instead of the woods or fields which had bordered the river almost all the way, this was obviously a swamp, a big one too. The only sign of hope was a small grove of scraggly trees three or 400 yards to the northwest. Scott wouldn't even look at me, but he didn't need to. I could hear the apology in his voice. My always protector, my knight errant, had gotten me, well, both of us, into real trouble. Not that I was blameless, of course. I did agree to this great adventure. Now, didn't I? We began the arduous trek, teetering from one jelly-topped hummock to the next. We only managed a clean jump to the next one about as frequently as we fell forward into the stinking water and had to haul ourselves onto the next one like some orca whale beaching itself. The mosquitoes were ferociously persistent, and their high-pitched buzzing was a torment in and of itself. About 50 feet from the grove of stunted trees, the last of the hummocks sank below the surface of the scummy water, and ahead there was only an area of viscous mud and sawgrass. You have to crawl, Scott exhorted me. Slither on your belly or you'll sink and get stuck in the mud. I was so exhausted I couldn't have walked upright if you'd offered me a year of free ice cream, so I slithered and crawled. The sawgrass was murderous, an uncountable number of tiny scalpels slashing at whatever skin was exposed to their excruciatingly sharp blades. 
As the sweat rolled down our cheeks and arms, the salt made this death of a thousand cuts brutally real. Without realizing it, I began to whimper deep in my throat. I was horrified to recognize the sound as my own voice, and I clamped my jaw shut. I'd never let Scott hear me being less brave than he was. But the burning pain and exhaustion was beyond anything I'd ever experienced, and I was truly scared. Then a strange lethargy stole over me, and I wasn't sure I could or even wanted to fight on. Somehow, with Scott's continuous, rather firm encouragement, I did. He reached land first and pulled me the last couple of feet to solid ground. We both lay there panting, limbs suddenly flaccid, trying to regain some small measure of strength in our legs and arms, some breath back into our lungs. The sun was low in the afternoon sky, and a slight breeze cooled our damp brows. When we could finally sit and then stand, even if on somewhat wobbly legs, we could see that solid land continued off to the northwest and we began to shuffle forward. We crossed a pasture devoid of any livestock, but the barbed wire fence in the distance could only mean a property line or a road. It was a road, a road we recognized, a country road a mere five miles from the outskirts of town. We had pulled that lousy raft all day long and suffered all that agony only to make a lousy five miles as a crow flies on that awful river. I was terribly depressed. As we resumed our sullen shamble homeward, our drenched shoes left wet, muddy prints behind us on the roadway. Scott finally whispered one of my own thoughts. Man, that Livingston guy must have been one tough son of a gun. There was another full minute of silence broken only by the rhythmic squelching of our sodden sneakers along the blacktop. Then in a low voice, suddenly taut with suppressed excitement and energy, he turned to me with a broad grin and exclaimed, next time we're gonna try for the source of the real Nile. It was just assumed I would be going along, so I grinned back. But I think that explains it all. It's who he was as a kid. It's who he become as a man. And I think we should be proud to have such an extraordinary hero in our midst in Wisconsin. And it's a sad thing that so very few people know that he even existed. And it's our hope that uh, this documentary will rectify that issue. Yeah. I can tell you the story about the nose cone, if you'd like. Yeah, I think um, that would, you know, since, since you, you, you mentioned it, I thought we'll have to come back to that and make sure that we get the story. Yeah, go ahead. You know, we'll see so, um, the story about the nose cone is that when they were dismantling all of the aircraft right before everybody uh, bugged out of Vietnam, and in fact they were literally blowing them up in some cases, uh, two guys who had flown with Scott took the art off the last of his helicopters off of Mustang 17 and uh, sort of smuggled it basically out of the country in their in their gear and for 20 long years they tried to give that nose cone art to somebody anybody mm -hmm. who would take it and preserve it they tried giving it to the army archives they tried giving it to Fort Rucker which is all where all helicopter pilots are trained and they kind of thought well you know he's probably the, one of the top helicopter pilots to ever come out of there, maybe they'll want it. Nope, they refused it. They tried to give it to the Smithsonian. <laughs> they tried to give it to the Milwaukee Museum. I mean, they were looking for anybody to take this. Yeah. And after 20 years, um, they finally decided that they would uh, simply approach my father and see if he wanted it. So they did, and when it came, it was just the nose cone, and my dad had it mounted on that, and for years it was at um, the local VFW uh, as, as part of their exhibition. But we take it around with us now to all of the um, presentations that we're making to the, to the pilots and to all of the other veterans who are in groups like the DAV and the AMVETS and the BVA and, and American Legion and VFW and so on. And it is, it is something that always engenders such a terrific response from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, in reality, uh, they, it meant so much to them when they were in combat. Uh, and it means a lot to them now to be able to see one of these and actually, you know, touch it again and so on. 
But um, uh, the other thing that has happened recently is that Scott was this year inducted into the VA Hall of Heroes in Madison. And there was a ceremony um, on Memorial Day for that. And it started, I believe, in 2002, and there have been 12 people inducted, and I think he's the most recent inductee into that. So, uh, And we took the nose cone there, too. And uh, once again, all the veterans, even the veterans just in the reception hall, uh, were just wanted to touch it, wanted to see it. So it means a lot to them. Yeah. Um, someone had commented, uh, Penny had commented, um, uh, that that this was something that had happened, um, and that the ceremony can be viewed on the in the website for the documentary. Right, right. So, um, and we'll maybe link the. It's honor in the air if if anybody wants to go and and learn uh, see a little bit more about the story and the the efforts to document and maybe, right maybe help out and um, uh, help help to fund it a little bit. That's always helpful, I'm sure. That's always helpful. Yes, I mean we we do want help and. But once again, you know, it's not just that we want it to be Scott's story. We want it to be the story of a group of men who fought with a great deal of honor and valor in a war that was extremely unpopular. I mean, there were no parades for these guys when they came home, yeah. unlike those veterans who came home from World War I or even World War II. The thing is, these guys were reviled and, and spit upon and um, accosted and, and assaulted when they mm -hmm. came home. And it made their service somehow less than extraordinary, somehow less than patriotic. And I think that that is something that needs to be addressed still. Mm -hmm. I don't think there has been enough of a, a redemption for, for them. And so that's one of the things we want to do with this film is kind of explore why these guys were there and what they did when they were there. And mm -hmm. Scott is one of those people and certainly a heroic part of it, but his story is, is kind of emblematic of theirs too. Yeah. I suppose, you know, you, you hear about um, veterans of er the earlier wars in which they were welcomed back as heroes and sometimes that's hard enough to, to, to revisit and only imagine. Well, as, as you were saying, uh, I think it was before we uh, started the recording here, but um, you know, you've been talking to some people, and some of the veterans just can't. It's it's hard for them to 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 just revisit those memories even today. We had one gentleman at the reunion who was telling us a story, and the story that he told us was that um, Scott had had um, a crash, and they had a new XO, a new unit commander. And uh, the guy somehow took umbrage with Scott having had a crash. And so a couple of weeks later, when the hydraulics on his helicopter failed after they'd been shot up and were limping home and, of course, crashed it again. Uh, and uh, when, they, when they finally got back, the guy said, that's it all when you're grounded and I'm going to make sure you never fly again. And uh, everybody was kind of um, distraught about that because they didn't really think it was a, a useful response. So as a group, in mass, apparently, they walked into their XO's office that evening and one by one took off their wings mm -hmm. and put them on the guy's desk and said, if Alwyn doesn't fly, we don't fly. And he said, I'll court-martial you. And uh, they said, fine, you try explaining to your boss why nobody's flying any missions tomorrow. And so he relented. But when this guy was telling me this, I, you know, he, he begins to get tears in his eyes. And I said, Charlie, you know, answer me this. You know, why would you guys... Do that? Why would you risk court martial over something like this? And he said, "You you don't understand. You just don't understand. We loved him." Mm -hmm. And of course, by that time, I'm crying, and you mm -hmm. know, and we're hugging. And but on the other hand, you know, this guy, this wonderful, 
brave man just could not bring himself to give a, a, a video interview because what he said was, I can't even talk to myself about this yet. So, I mean, think about what it cost these men for the rest of their lives to do what their country was asking of them. I mean, it is, a, it is something that most of us who have never been in war, mm -hmm. and that's most of us, yeah. can never, ever understand. I mean, there's a bond there that is just unshakable. So Absolutely. we hope that we hope that what we're doing will help express some of our appreciation and, and some of the truth yeah. of what what occurred there. All right, I'm just going to take a quick look and see if there's any other questions out there. Um, let's see here. So Carl Allen on YouTube. Um, uh, commented and said that he flew with Scott for a short period um, in the 117th AHC Sidewinder right. gunship platoon. So, but yeah, thanks for for um, tuning in, Carl, and thank you for for your your. Well, thank you for well. your service. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And for anybody else who was joining us as well, for sure. What position was Carl in? Was he a pilot or a crew chief or a gunner? Does uh, he say? No, he he hasn't. He didn't share. But if if you want to uh, follow up, Carl. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, he just said that he, he flew with them for a, a short time. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, Sue Reitz uh, uh, asked about um, how Carl or how um, Scott felt about the Vietnamese people in the country while he was there. Oh, well. You want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, Scott thought we were there for uh, a purpose. And I mean, he truly, he was one of those people who truly believed that uh, we were there to, to essentially bring freedom to the Vietnamese people. And um, uh, he, he, I suspect that he may have questioned that more as time went on. But on the other hand, he loved the country. He, he absolutely loved the country, he loved the people. And maybe, maybe it's growing up rural poor in, in central Wisconsin that gave him a feeling for people who were so, so hardworking and so industrious and, and so family oriented themselves. And of course, one of the things that happened was he met a young woman uh, who was working in the uh, officers club. And like he became my knight, uh, in many of the adventures of our youth, he became her knight and kind of protected her from everybody. Everybody knew to stay away from Teresa because uh, Scott was protecting her. And ultimately, she became his wife. And she is the mother of his uh, two children, Scott and Heather. And, uh, you know, the, in, the impact that Scott's service had on our family was that many, many other members of our family have been in service. I mean, my, my son, Jason, my brother, Sean, my, um, my uh, Scott's son himself has been in the service. And uh, so many and many others also were in the service. And, and uh, but Scott thought that you served with honor because you were doing what your country was asking of you and that your country probably wouldn't ask it if it weren't important. And one of the things he absolutely believed was that Russia was irrelevant. It was all China. Hmm. And that it was always going to be China going forward. And I suspect that that's probably been proven true. So, and his love for the Vietnamese people extended to his uh, love of honor, too. Mm -hmm. So, and once again, I mean, we hope that this story is a story that uh, other people, you know, we hardly have civics and government being taught to our children. And perhaps they don't understand as, as much as we did when we were growing up that there is a social contract and that you have to give back to your community, you have to give back to your uh, your country and your community because it is it is part of what your responsibility is as a 
as a citizen of this democracy. And I think Scott uh, understood that and wanted mm -hmm. to do that and mm -hmm. wanted to be a part of that. The day he was killed by a drunk driver, I was on the phone with him. And at the time, I was the only and first woman who had ever been hired as a professional in job service here in Wausau. And there was an opening for a um, helicopter pilot for the governor's office. And I thought, boy, well, if Scott wants to get out of the army, this would be a good one. But mostly it was an excuse just to call my brother on the state's dime, sure. you know, long distance. So I called him and uh, he said, geez, I'd like to talk, but you know, I'm on my way to Washington and they've called me uh, to the new war college and I think they're gonna offer him a position there. But uh, at the same time, Proxmire's office had contacted him about an opening that was gonna be coming up for a congressional seat in Wisconsin. And he was saying, geez, you know, I, you know, can anybody actually get involved in politics and, and still be, you know, stay honorable? And I said, geez, you know, if, if there's a state that might let you do it, I think maybe it's Wisconsin because, I mean, think about guys like Defollet and, and my, your own grandfather ran for governor of the state against the notorious Julius Heil. So, I mean, your grandfather was an honorable man, so he must have thought he could get into politics and still be, still keep his honor. And Scott said, well, you know, I'm not really sure about that, but I'll listen to what they have to say and uh, I'll let you know. But then he started on his drive and he was killed by a driver who had been drinking all day and told his wife that he was going to commit suicide and take somebody else with him. And he took Scott. And um, at first, of course, they told us that he had been killed immediately, but that really wasn't true. I mean, he lingered for about two hours, which is really a, a big part of that tragedy, to think that he was alone with strangers and dying in a strange place, and not even Tess, his wife, knew what had happened to him. I mean, none of us knew, so... But um, he was a big part of our family and a big part of the leadership of our family. And I think it, uh, it almost killed my parents mm -hmm. to have him lost like that after all those years in Vietnam and all that danger. Yeah. So. But you're, you're carrying on his, his memory and, and telling his story, which is, is amazing. So. We hope so. Um, I think, I, I'm, on that note, I think maybe I, I'm not seeing any other... Oh, um... I, just to, just to follow up here, uh, Carl did did get back here. He said that he was a pilot, um, and then when he when another pilot came to the one seventeenth Sidewinder, uh, he went uh, went to the first platoon, Annie's gang, and eventually to Warlord th number thirteen. So yeah, so he, um, they would they would um, cover our, our slicks and combat assaults. So yeah, sure, yeah, cool, cool, gunships, yeah. All right. Well, I think I think we've kind of hit hit about the time we were going for, um, and we've kind of hit all the questions. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Well, thank you so much story. for the the absolute privilege of being here, and and it's just been a pleasure. Yeah. And and thank you to all all of you who are watching. And um, yeah, well, go check out the the documentary. Um, if it's if you're watching this way in the future, maybe it's already out. Uh, otherwise. Um, there's honorintheair.com is the place you can go to do that. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, again, have a wonderful afternoon.